Hello and welcome to Your Believing Hearts podcast for January 11th, 2023. This week I'll be discussing unions, Sony stuff, and some mini games in the news section, and later I'll talk about the cute little game I played recently, plus some 2020 shoe shows I'm just getting around to now. I'm your host, Mario 8th. You can find me across the internet, all of them, at Mario 8th. Right now I'm on Tumblr and co-host and I'm still on Twitter, or if you'd like to see the games I'm playing as I'm playing them, you can check it out ggapp.io slash Mario 8th. You can find the YouTube videos I make or the YouTube version of this podcast on youtube.com slash at Mario 8th, or you can find the audio version of this podcast at anchor.fm slash Mario 8th. Anyway, let's jump right in to the news. So the first news story I pulled was the 300 QA developers under Bethesda and ZeniMax, which owns Bethesda, which are all under Microsoft, unanimously voted to unionize. And this is just a wonderful story. At the end of last year, it was announced that 300 workers from Bethesda ZeniMax voted to, or were going to vote on a union, which will be one of the first, if not the first union under Microsoft. And just at, in the new year, on January 3rd, they tweeted out, guess what? We won the union. And it's, it's just really exciting news. This is going to be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, union in the video game space in at least America. And it's, it's like the biggest union under Microsoft, for sure. Of course, they only just unionized. Unanimous, so that's really good. Everyone who joined the union clearly wanted to do it. But this is where the hard part really begins. Now they're going to have to get on the table with ZeniMax and broker a new union contract. And we'll see how that goes. Hopefully it'll be good. There's going to be a lot of tough battles when it comes with unionization, the unionization of the games industry in the oncoming decade or whatever or so. And I I hope all the best for the unionized workers and any workers who are hoping to unionize soon. And the more the better. If this one goes through, that'll be even more fantastic. Even better news is because Microsoft is under such strict, uh, such strict, they're being watched over very closely by the FTC due to the acquisition of Activision on Microsoft's end. They're not going to be able to do much of the union busting that they would have otherwise done with all the other potential unions that I'm sure they've managed to shot, shoot down over the past 30 years. So hopefully, hopefully with that and the fact that there's 300 of them and unions are more popular than they have been in a very long time, hopefully this goes through. It's very exciting news. I should also mention this article is written up by Justin Carter from Game Developer. Link in the show notes. Up next, so anecdotally, I've seen quite a few PS5s in the wild now. I Like every once in a while, I'm, I'm, me and the family, we go to Target just to walk around a little bit. Maybe buy something for my sister. And I noticed a few times now, at least twice... I look down at the the game section, and there's just a PS5 sitting in the case. And I think I saw one at a GameStop the other day when I was picking up an order. And it was it was surprising both times. And now, Sony is saying that the drought of PS5s is over. That they have fixed their supply issues with getting PS5s out into the world, so hopefully more places will start having PS5s. And I still vividly remember when I got my PS5. It was fairly close to launch, only a couple months later. And I had just gotten a new job, so I had a little a little more money than I was used to at the time. So I thought, yeah, I can justify buying a console that doesn't have any games on it yet, that I'm not going to play all that often. And I did. And I started doing the thing where you wait in the Sony queue on their Sony Direct. Sony Direct, I think it's called. And wait and hope you get you hope you get poked up at the front of the line and you get a chance to buy one. Of course, what I did, and since since more PS5s are coming out of the world, I could probably just say it. What I wound up doing was I pulled up eight web browsers. I pulled up like two on my work computer, two on another computer, two on the computer I'm recording this on, two or three on on certain devices. I had it on two different phones. I had it on as many devices as I could. 
and I got one. I think on my work computer, it, I got to the front of the queue on that one. And I bought one, and I was so excited. And I, fi- I finally hit purchase, and I got up from my desk, and I went to go get the mail, and I was physically shaking with excitement that I was able to actually get one way back then. And I've actually played it a lot more than I thought I would. It's it's definitely top of my consoles. It's probably my favorite console right now, just because it's the newest one does the best graphics or whatever. I it, I was just really excited to get one back then, but that wait is over. I didn't have to play Scalper Prices. Hopefully no one else will have to play Scalper Prices anymore because oh, you soon you should just be able to walk into a Target or a Walmart and buy one, and that's that's going to be great. Great for more people to be able to play more games. Continuing on Sony for a little bit, they have also revealed a really cool accessibility controller. It's about time, but cool nonetheless. So if you haven't seen pictures of it, links are in the script or in the show notes. This is a write-up by Michael Mewerton from Polygon.com, and it's, it's it's the same white. I don't like white consoles that much, but it's the same white as the general PS5 console, except the controller is kind of like in a circle. And has like a joystick or a joy or thumb stick pad kind of sticking out one of the sides. And supposedly it's supposed to help. And they've done a lot of research. It's supposed to help those who are um, unable to handle a regular controller too well. Again, I'm speaking out of my wheelhouse on this a little bit. I just want to point out that it's really cool that they are finally putting something else. Hit day. Hidayaki Nishino sent on PlayStation Blog to address common challenges faced by many players with limited motion control, including difficulty holding a controller for long periods, accurately pressing small clusters of buttons or triggers, or positioning, shum- or positioning thumbs and fingers optimally on a standard controller. And then the controller includes a, quote, robust kit of swappable components including a variety of analog stick caps and buttons in different shapes and sizes, Nishino said. And it's about time Xbox has had one for it feels like a couple years now. And there is still no release date as to when this one is going to be coming out. But it's cool that they're doing it. Hopefully it's not too expensive. If I have if I had to guess, I'd hope it's no more than a hundred. I mean the regular PlayStation controllers are already 80, I think, and those are really expensive. And this has a lot more parts and components too, but in but it, they're also trying to be accessible, so I would hope, I would hope that Sony makes it accessible to purchase as well. Anyway, it's it's cool they're doing it. I'm happy they're doing it. I probably won't end up getting one. I don't need something like that, but I'm so glad anyone who might is going to be able to get one eventually. This year, maybe... <laughs> And that's it for the news. I pulled news for the past couple weeks, but because of the holidays, there wasn't too much that interested me. So now I'm going to move on to what I've been doing. So I've been doing basically four things. I'm not going to talk much about the first one. I've been playing RuneScape a lot. About three weeks ago, a little more, because I had to take my skill cape off on free player mode to do the holiday event. And so I bought a membership to put it back on, and then I wanted to get my money's worth out of that membership, so I've just been playing it a lot it's RuneScape. It's old school RuneScape. It's an old game that's also kind of new sometimes. I don't need to talk about it. What I do want to talk about playing is in the first couple days of the year, I played a Lil Gator game, and it was a really cute time. And Lil Gator game, I completely forgot to talk about my other news story. Wow. Anyway, Lil Gator game, I'll jump back to the other one in a second. Lil Gamer game is really cute. It's, it's, it's following in a line of games that have obviously drawn inspiration from Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. This one wears it wears the inspiration incredibly so. It, it, it doesn't say Zelda outright, but the little gator is clearly dressed up as Zelda. They make a lot of references. There's a, there's a move you can get really early on where a, you can just flop your body to the ground and roll around like what happens when Link Link gets hurt and falls for a long while in Breath of the Wild. But it's a really neat game. You you explore a little island, you get a little stick or other various weapons, and you bash cardboard monsters, and then 
you talk to a bunch of people around this island and do little favors for them, but the thing is, you're just a little gator guy. You're just, you're just a little person. And you, everyone is playing make-believe game when this is happening. And, you're, and it's, it's a really cute time. The story was also pretty touching. This little gator trying to get their sister to join them in playing. So everything that you are doing in the game, uh, he's controlling the little gator, is trying to get them to get their sister to start playing with you again. And it's it's just a really nice story. I had I had a real good time. It's it's really short, like four, five hours or so, but definitely worth it. I had a great time. I was really excited for it last year. And, and I'm glad I enjoyed it enough. And I, to tie this into the last news story I want to talk to, you know, I really appreciate this trend of games that is clearly taking inspiration from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, but putting their own twist on it. In this case, they're putting it on a twist where there's nothing actually happening in the game, it's all just a bunch of cardboard things placed around an island. There's no combat in it, you just fight the cardboard, but I... I but like the exploration of the world is clearly drawn inspiration and the and the dialogue is really clever and and I really get time with it but there are some other indie games coming out next year that also are drawing some pretty heavy inspiration from that and so I'm going to go through this article here is a list of 23 indie games coming out written by Nicole Carpenter from Polygon you can check out the full thing in the show notes but I wanted to go over a few of my highlights from this list now, it's not in the right order anymore, but one of them was the game Chia, which has the player controlling a little girl, but this little girl, in an almost Mario Odyssey fashion, is able to put her spirit into either a bunch of different animals or a bunch of different objects and control the island, control the game that way, and it looks really cool her spirit kind of flies into it and then there's a fun combat scene where she flies into a lantern and then she's able to shoot the lantern out and hit an enemy with it or she can fly into a bird and fly around go into a turtle and swim around and it looks very zelda breath of the wild like because she has a hang glider because every exploring game needs to have a breath of the wild type hang glider now i love that though I love that type of game. That 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 that's that's one thing I really wished like Ghost of Tsushima had is the ability to jump off of thing and glide. So I'm really glad games are stealing from that. It looks really cute. And that was the last game on the list, so I guess I'm going up now. Uh Schism Schism Skim S C H I M is another really cool looking game. I saw this in an indie showcase of some sort a bit last year. You take control of a shadow thing and you try to get to an end goal while jumping through other shadows. So if a person is walking by, you can jump into their shadow, but then you can get out at the light pole and then get out, move around the light pole to get behind a bench's shadow, so on and so forth. It's a really cool looking game. I I I was I really loved the look of it when I first saw it and I'm I'm really excited. Hopefully it's coming out this year. It's expected sometime in 2023, so Look out for that one as well. I'm not going to go through all the games in this list. There's 23 of them, so I definitely recommend going through and looking at some of the ones that are a little more interesting to you. Another one I've been hyped for for a while now is Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. This game is in drawing direct inspiration and maybe a little bit of... It, here, the description says Jet Set Radio Tribute. So it's really trying to be a more modern take on Jet Set Radio, and it looks great. The music is fantastic. The gameplay looks really fun. There's a bunch of different ways of transportation, like bicycles or roller skates or other things. I, I really can't wait for this game. It got delayed into this year, last year. It's supposed to be a 2022 game. Now it's coming out sometime in summer on Switch and Windows PC. I'm, I'm really excited for it. This game looked pretty cute. It's this game called Troubleshooting, where you take control of a I guess a person inside of a computer and it's a first person shooter adventure game where instead of shooting you're clicking on them you don't have a gun you have a pointer clicker and you click things and you can left click to shoot right click to interact and it pulls up an old style 
uh, right-click menu, and it, and it looks really interesting. Another game I saw earlier last year, but I still think looks fantastic, is this game called Dordone, which is spelled D-O-R-D-O-G-N-E, for those of you, like myself, who don't know French at all. But basically, it's this cute little adventure game. You control a little girl, and then eventually that same little girl grown up. But the the real big draw is, as you're exp- you, you're playing through this adventure game, the backgrounds are so beautifully done watercolor paintings. Just the art style alone has completely sold me. Hopefully it plays well, but I, I'm also real excited for that. This is coming to pretty much everything sometime this year as well. And that is all I want to talk about. Again, a lot more games I didn't get to in this article. Go ahead and check it out yourself. There's some real good stuff. And that is it for video games, I guess, because I forgot to get to this around in the news section. So back to what I've been doing. I'm going to talk about a couple TV shows I've been watching. And so I technically started Dragon House, or as others might refer to as House of the Dragon, a little bit last year, uh, last few weeks of last year. I'm a little more than halfway through, three episodes left, I think. And I don't have too much to say about it. I don't want to get too much into spoiler sections. I, I'm a big fan of A Song of Ice and Fire. I read through all the books in very quick succession in high school, and I really love it. There was a moment the other day when I just started spurting out a bunch of lore that I just remembered of about that world because it was all hidden in the back of my mind. And I've been thinking about this show a lot recently, so it kind of just came sputtering out. But the show itself is is just off to me right now. And I think I think one of the big reasons why I'm not liking it is well, the biggest reason is Game of Thrones really burned me those last few seasons of the show, and so it, it's taking a lot to get me to buy in on this show, but the, but other, but other than what I'm going, the baggage I'm going into with the show itself just has such fast pacing, and it took me pretty much until this most recent episode and talking about it a lot to really understand how I was watching it wrong. Because shows like Game of Thrones, or a re- to pick a recent show, shows like Andor are much slower paced and they dive a lot more into the characters and what they're thinking and what they're doing. But the way that Dragon House has been doing is, slight spoilers, episode to episode, it can jump to as much as 10 years in between. And for a while, that's that was just so completely jarring to me because I wanted to be able to sit with these characters and figure out what they were doing. But it fi- I finally realized it the other day because this show is based off of what is basically a history, what is basically a history book for this show. And what history books do is they just have a passage of a certain event explained what happened, and then they jump to the next interesting passage. From So it could be three months later, it could be three years later. That's how history books work. And that is how this the book that this show is based off of is working. And that's how this show is working. It's not really focusing on character development. It is focusing on the major events in the years before the Game of Thrones show started proper. And I don't know how far the show is going to go. Again, I haven't even finished season one just yet. I've never read the book. But I I need to go into it differently now. I need to go into it where I think, okay, this is where this major event happened in the previous however long amount of time the characters have changed. We don't get to see that character development. And again, I think that's a knock against the show. But we don't get to see the character development. We do get to see how that character development has changed the character and this is how they are now, and then in the next episode, everyone will have changed a lot more, and we get to see the next major event that happens there. And so I guess I'm enjoying the show. I, I want to keep watching it, but it's just it's just been really difficult for me to really get invested, I guess, because, again, I like good character development, and we don't get that in Dragon House. We just get what happens after the character has been developed, if, if that makes any sense. And the last show I've been watching, and I'm also... Oh, I think I also only have three episodes left of this one, but I'm going to finish it sooner. 
uh, is Stranger Things Season 4. I've been meaning to get to it for a while now, but just the other day I didn't want to really start a new game, and I didn't really want to listen to a podcast and play more RuneScape or watch a movie or whatever, so I finally said, okay, I, I, I've watched the first three seasons, uh, let's, let's watch this new season of Stranger Things, and this show is... it's weird. I'm liking it a lot less than Dragon House. I'm liking it a lot, lot, lot less than Andor. But it's it's definitely it's it's definitely motivated me to keep watching it, but there are definitely a lot of moments where it doesn't hold my attention. Like every episode is just too long. I have I've written I've I've written a whole host of notes. Maybe I'm gonna pull up a few of them in just a second, once I can find it. Okay, yeah, so so there's some good stuff about this show, like, there's some really fun camera angles, the licensed music, they do a really good thing with them. They, they, they have some good moments where they bring licensed 80s music into the show. It is a little bit of a crutch, but it's it's done well, a lot of it. But then sometimes the pacing is just off, like, I think literally every single episode I've watched so far could have easily shaven off 20 and 30 minutes to make it just a better show. And they're also just doing so much with it. Like, at a, like whenever they're focusing on what made Stranger Things Season 1 good, which was tense, horror, you're not sure what's happening, you're not sure how these characters are going to get out of it, I think the show is still pretty darn good. But then there are other sections where it's an action movie, like, there's nothing horror about it. It's, it's, they, they went full on Resident Evil, where it's not horror anymore. It's an action movie, and it's a couple action stars doing action things, and it feels so out of place. And I, I got to a moment recently where there's an, there's an episode where it's almost like, it's all, it, be, it becomes almost Marvel movie level writing. And I mean that as a detriment. I do not, I think Marvel movie writing is oftentimes pretty awful, and Stranger Things is leaning into that quite a bit. Like, one scene is basically like, uh, we're gonna have to build you, be- we're gonna have to make you bigger and better again. And it just felt so tacky. And then there's one, and then, and then, and then there's a lot of gore. Like, there's a lot of killing in this show, and the CG for these deaths looks really bad. Like, truly awful, really bad. And then, and the first time they did it, it was alright, because they cut around it a lot, they didn't focus on it too much. But they have one, like, in almost every episode, and it continues to look bad, and they linger on it a little too long each time. And for, for an effect that looks this bad, they keep showing it a lot. And I don't understand that design choice. And then just the weirdest thing happened in the most recent episode I watched. The tone feels off because in one second you're having these really brutal death scenes. And the next, it's this really weird children's show where there's a bunch of kids running around doing goofy things and they're tricking their dad. And it just feels so incredibly off. But I don't know. I'm going to keep watching it. I have a podcast waiting for me at the end, which is really the main reason I'm watching it at all is so I can listen to this podcast hear other people talk about hopefully hopefully they'll share some of my opinions with it I don't know but that's about all that's about all I've done in the past few weeks and I hope you enjoyed thank you for listening again if you did not hear me at the top all my socials are linked in the show notes and I'm at Mario Waith pretty much everywhere that I am going to be And if you'd like to, I hear leaving ratings on like an iTunes or something can be pretty good. Or if you're watching on the YouTube version, leave a comment and thumbs up and maybe subscribe. Subscribe to the RSS feed on anchor.fm slash Mario Let me know if you liked anything in this, I guess. Is that what you're supposed to say at an end of a podcast episode? I don't know. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.